Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the Able Contemporary Gallery. I'm extremely pleased to be here with Anna Lesky to discuss her show, Moon Room, in gallery number five. Part of this exhibit, and a part of it that's very important, is a composition created by her husband, Nick Orleski, called Companion to the Moon Room. And for those people watching the video later, um, I would like to just listen to that for a minute or so before we start to talk so you have a sense of the importance of that with the show. she does here at the gallery. Um, but she is also, uh, in this show is a testament to the work she does in her studio. Um, she's an outstanding painter and visual artist living in the Madison area. Um, I first met Anne because she moved to Madison. She was doing some graduate work in printmaking, uh, started working in the gallery, and you started painting shortly after that. Yeah, I started painting after undergraduate study, kind of in between before I went into graduate school, partly because I had a printmaking background, but I didn't have a press. So a printmaker without a press quickly becomes a painter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had been sort of starting to paint a little bit, and then I went to graduate school to study printmaking, um, thanks to the encouragement of Andy Rubin, who is here today. and. Um, and then I was sort of doing both while in grad school. I was painting some and doing a lot of printmaking. And then after my graduate studies, again, found myself without a press. So continued to paint. And now I consider myself a painter, not a printmaker. Yeah. And you are a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, let's talk, of, I want to talk about this show a lot in, in this conversation, because mm -hmm. you've been working on this body of work for over a year. Yep. Mm -hmm. and you have also included in this exhibit these casing paintings. I think there's a lot of interesting things to talk about. I want to start to talk about the concept behind the work. I do want to talk a little bit about technical things because I think it's interesting to work in casing. <laughs> and and then also you made a sculpture, which is one of, I think, the first sculptures you've made. Outside of school, yeah. Um, and, so, um, and, you know, to create this whole experience and it's such a success and so, um, but talk about the the genesis of the idea for this show. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I'm thinking back to kind of where the concept started. It started as a series of small paintings that I was making based off of the the names of the moons. So 
cultures throughout history have assigned names to each moon of the month throughout the season. And they often, a lot of them come from Native American cultures, but they're kind of, they've been Americanized in this way and we sort of picked and choose different ones that have significance for each month. So I did a series of small paintings using those as the titles of the paintings. Um, and just sort of thinking about what, like, why, why we do that as a culture, and, and it often sort of marks um, maybe like the, animal, the movement of the animals, or the plants that are in season, or different times of year that are weather related. Um, so I really enjoyed that exploration, and I wanted to expand upon it, but I, it, both by making larger paintings but also sort of spending more time really reflecting on the sort of changes in nature that happen throughout a moon cycle, which is just short, you know, just short of a month. So um, they, they kind of correlate with the time of the year, but it changes too. So like this year, I'm also tracking moon cycles and it's like different plants are coming up during like the Jan, you know, or not January, but like March. Almost. March, <laughs> we definitely have more plants that are coming up than last year because the weather is different and, and also the timing of the moon is different. But, but back to that original, yeah. because I remember those small paintings, mm -hmm. but do you remember what, because, you know, your work wasn't about mm -hmm. moons before that, so do right. you remember what made you, what made me? Or maybe you don't, because we just all, all have these ideas coming in and... Yeah, no, I, mean, I don't, it, I mean, that's been, that series happened quite a while ago, and I think it was, because my, my work has sort of always been architecturally based, yes. and I was pulling away from that in different aspects and working more abstractly, and I think along with that sort of building an abstract form in a painting, my, it allowed my mind to go to other places besides just the man-made world. And I started to think about different parts of nature. I started, and I think it also, like, I did a, I did a lot of writing with this series of work and reflecting on the moon, and I think it had to do with, like, the moon's always there for us. Yeah. Like, this idea of a constant. And so it was something that I could sort of uh, attach myself to emotionally in a way that the man-made landscape isn't, it, right. you can't attach to, yeah. because it's this permanent, it's, I mean, permanent, but not quite so permanent. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rebecca and I are taking a class about the moon and they're talking about how it's slowly moving away from us. So Aww. someday we may lose our moon. <laughs> <laughs> But in this time, yeah. in this place, yeah. it is a it is a fixture in the right. sky that we can yeah. depend on. Because your work previous to this um, had a lot of similarities in it in terms of the way that you compose a picture or mm -hmm. these white lines that get drawn out in the the forms. But it was all referencing architecture. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just interesting. In fact, some of the early paintings that you did were. Like you were painting overpasses and mm -hmm. parking ramps and things she painted, and some of you are nodding, so you remember that. Uh, but th but what was interesting about those is there was no sign of human life in them. It was like there were no cars, um, there were no people on the highways. Yeah. It was almost like the sort of dystopian or like left it, like everybody, all the people just disappeared. <laughs> and then and then they, and then you became it seemed like they became more about just the forms and the abstraction of yeah. those things and. Um, and, they, and it was really beautiful. And these somehow feel um, more emotional to me. Mm -hmm. And someone actually told me that at the opening, that oh, these paintings seemed really, yeah. um, that there was a lot of emotion in them. I don't know if you feel that way. I, I mean, I do feel that way. And I think it does, it has to do with the amount of reflection that I did personally while I was creating this body of work. I, I think I poured a lot more of that into yeah. the paintings themselves. Um, it's interesting that people are picking up on that because yeah. they're like they're even more removed from the familiar. Yeah. Like the architectural work 
there was like a, a jumping off point that you could sort of see in the pieces and be like, oh, I recognize that. I can. There's an entry point that's very familiar, and these are much more like ephemeral and strange in that yeah. way. Um, so it's interesting that. Yeah, I mean, and and I also wonder if the emotion also partly comes from the soundtrack. Oh, like being in the space yeah. with with this, like this the the music sets such a tone, right? That I think that pulls emotion out of people. That, no, that's true, and and I think in this, like, yeah. because just I didn't think about this before until just now in this conversation. It's almost sort of, and here we are at the. It's like the chapel and the congregation, <laughs> but there's a chapel. Like there's something, um, you know. If you go to Catholic Church, you have to. You're supposed to walk around and look at these visualizations of the suffering of Christ or something. You know what I mean? There's this kind of way that you walk around. Yeah. But there's a central focal point. There's music, which is very emotional. I don't know if you realized it all that you're kind of creating a chapel. I, it was not intentional, <laughs> but I was raised Catholic, so it might just be like a dead in there. Like, oh, it's oh, me. And, um, and um, it's a you know it's a homage to the moon. It's yeah, because it, yeah. it also it feels is, yeah. loving. It's like yeah. you feel like because if you, if anyone who's here, there's a copy of this book. The, there's a book that Anne wrote, right. which is lovely and. It's very personal, and there's a copy of it in the gallery, and there's usually a chair sitting there, so people can come in and look through it, or you can ask us. Um, but if you have time today, or to come back another time and read it, there's, and you don't have to read a book to, you know, you could just yeah. choose a passage to read, and you'd get a sense of. Um, but there's personal things about your relationship with your daughter, and you know, your observations in the world, which are really meaningful and. But I, I think when you read the book, you definitely understand the emotion put yeah. into it. But I think you can pick up on it even without, without yeah. reading the book. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it, it, I mean, it makes sense that that transcends the changes because I'm, you know, like I'm yeah. in my studio reflecting on the work, and yeah, you can't not bring emotion into it. Yeah. So how did you, when you were approaching the cycles of the moon, mm -hmm. talk about the color choices in the work. Yeah, um, I mean, they're somewhat based on the seasons. Like January moon is very icy. Mm -hmm. um, there's these are you know going into fall and they start to turn more autumnal and the color you know. So I, I was thinking of that cyclical yeah. kind of transition from winter to spring to summer to fall back to winter and how. Like the colors that are in our world during that time, and it's not. I'm not drawing specifically from a palette that I saw necessarily during that time. Like they were all. I was kind of working on all of them simultaneously, so it wasn't like I painted this one in January and it was the color I saw in January. But <laughs> right. It was more that emotion, I guess. Yeah. Was, yeah okay. So there was some just yeah. simply intuitive. Work. Yeah. Yeah, it was intuitive. It, I mean, it was intentional. Sure. Um, I but you didn't have some formula. No. Or you weren't thinking this needs to be like it wasn't math math. You know, you know what I'm trying to no. say. No, there it was. It was more just influence from like observation of the landscape and personal observation and just like playing with color yeah. and color combinations that I found interesting. Um, and and then for me, like the shapes are sort of, the shapes and the colors are based off of the colors in the ground and the sky, mm -hmm. so they stay within like each piece stays within sort of a finite tonal range. Yeah. In that way, so that I feel like that makes them more cohesive. Right. So, so that 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 play in color is very intentional, but why I chose. You know this gray and that pink yeah. was it was just yeah I guess my training as an artist my right? <laughs> sense of color yeah um, and it, and this body work really explored color in a way that I haven't done in a long time and that was really exciting for me well and I also I think a lot of I know there's artists in in the audience today too and you know sometimes you you have an idea 
And there's a million paths you can go down with a particular idea and you have to narrow down and make decisions and do that thing. And to give yourself an ability, it was like you explored this idea and then you explored almost every version. I mean, not every version. <laughs> oh, I could but, go on. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I love the way that the, the you explored so many very different variations of the form, mm -hmm. which changes, and then the colors. And I mean, there must have been something really satisfying about that. Was there ever a point where it was like, oh, another one of these, or and, and then oh. <laughs> and then and then how did you talk about? Um, how you, was it just through sketching that you changed the forms? Oh, the form, um, the form I have a little bit, like I have a formula kind of, I have, it starts out with three shapes that I lay down on the, on the panel and then I, which is just, it's improv, it's improvisational. So I'm, I don't have a plan for where the shapes are going to go, but I have like there's a, an idea of what I'm going to do. And I did a lot of drawing before I kind of mastered this. Um, so then I would put these shapes down and then I would just interconnect the points of those shapes with each other and then look at it and then play with that. So it, it wasn't sketched. Maybe the first few were sketched out ahead of time as I was trying to develop it. But by the last ones, I was... Just, I was just doing this formula, playing with the shape, and then I'm going into the color, and that's really like giving it the dimension, pushing and pulling things into the background and pulling things forward, and all that is done with the color. So I draw the shape, yeah. and then I start adding the color in to start to build that <clears throat> dimension in place. And as you're working, you're just looking at it and seeing how it, how the changes you're making are making it Right. Dimensional, yeah, and what's happening to yeah. it, and kind of, yeah, and the first few were clumsier and had to be like, reworked <laughs> in different ways. But by the end, it was like, and I and I would go back. Like by the end, I really started to understand how to play with the dimension of that shape, and then I went back and worked on some of the earlier pieces to sort of tie the whole thing back together. Yeah, in a way. So, like this one, I was telling. Susan earlier was one of the first ones to be finished in the series. And then at the very end, I went back and completely reworked it and <laughs> changed the whole palette and like reworked the shape in a different way just to, cause it wasn't, it was simple. It was simpler in shape and the palette was not as, like not as sophisticated as I wanted it to be. Once you had gone through this. Once thing. I had like made this whole journey. Yeah. So yeah. I had to go back. Revisited. And then, yeah. <laughs> uh, good. While we're still talking about the paintings, mm -hmm. um, uh, some people don't know what casein is as a pigment. Yeah. So can you tell us what casein is, and then the inherent like struggles with casein? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, casein is a paint that has a milk protein, casein, as the binder. So like oil paint has oil as the binder, acrylic has a polymer as the binder, casein has this milk protein as the thing that holds the pigment in the paint. Um, so it's very matte, very flat, but it can be buffed so you can get sheen to it. So there's a lot of diversity that you can bring into that, to that surface. Um, but it's, it's fussy. It dries really quickly. It dries really quickly, but it also stays, like if you, if you re-wet it, it can, it can like reactivate layers below it, so you can, you can get a muddy mess very quickly. You have, <laughs> like you have, it cures, right? Like it if does. you don't want to mess with it, you have to let it dry over essentially for, yeah, months. Yeah. Or, I mean, like I would, I would often like, I would put a color field down on a piece as I was working on it. And then I would leave it alone for two weeks. And I would work on a different piece. And, and then I would come back to that one and then I could do, then I could paint the horizon line or start to figure out the next move. Um, and then I would have to leave it alone for like two weeks and then come back and work on it again. So it's, in some ways, I, I haven't worked a lot with clay, but I feel like it has a little bit of that kinship to clay where you can work it 
just enough, and then you have you have to know when you can when you can manipulate it, and when it just needs to be left alone. Yeah, mm. and casein is at least the way that I'm thinking of casein is very much like that. It's yeah. this kind of understanding of the medium. Yeah, that that just comes over time of using it. Right. Yeah. And patience. <laughs> and patience. And then the white lines. Yeah, you're oh. sketching back in afterwards. Yeah, right? so is it the very last thing you do? It's it's the very first thing I do after I lay out the background colors. So I get my background colors settled, right, and that, and I create all that atmosphere in the background. Then I draw the shape and inside the lines. Then I go and I do all the coloration of the shape, and then I go back in and I refine all those lines at the end. So it's sort of the first part of building the shape and the last thing that I do on each one. I feel like that drawing back into it, it's the printmaker in you. Yeah, you know? it's definitely the printmaker. <laughs> I'm using a lot of printmaking yeah. tools while yeah. I'm doing that last part. And the so the panels that I'm working on are a clay board. So it's a clay, like a super slick clay surface that's on the panels and then you're able to inscribe into the panels to create that really crisp white line. Yeah. So at some point, I when we talked, um, you know, I knew for this because you know we planned these shows way in advance, and I knew you had the series of paintings. And then I'm trying to remember there. Then there were the two other parts that really um, make the installation sing. Um, the sculpture is a beautiful part of it, and then the music that that Nick composed. So at one point did you know that you were going to make a sculpture, and then at what point did you know that you that Nick was going to join you mm -hmm. in collaboration? Um, I told a few people that I felt would hold me accountable that I was going to make a sculpture early on. <laughs> <laughs> so that I would have to stick to it and actually do it. Say that loud so you feel shame. Right. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the people that are like, how's that sculpture going? Yeah. Yeah. Those are the people I told I was going to make a sculpture. <laughs> and then they would check in with me. Um, so I knew early on that I wanted to make, that I wanted to see these paintings that I was making at, and that, that object, that dimensional object in three dimensions. Like I'm playing with dimension in the paintings. It seemed only fitting to play with dimension outside of a flat plane. And um, so it was, it was something I wanted to do. I was doing some mock-ups and kind of playing with different ideas in my studio, but the sculpture itself didn't come together until, like completely together until February. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. We can make this in March. <laughs> so, so I started, I mean, I started working on it in the summer. I had built the armchairs and I was playing with them in different ways. Um, trying to figure out how they were going to fit together and how I was going to get it up into the air <laughs> so that you had to look, you know, yeah. it, I wanted it to be up Aww. so that you had to look up at it like you look up at the moon, which was the conversation we had when we were hanging it. Um, Richard Jones was kind of to help us put it up and um, it was, yeah, I mean, we had it down on the floor and it's like, it's interesting down yeah. here because you can see you can sort of see how it's constructed a little bit more, but it needed to be up. Yeah. In the air. It's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then music? Yeah. So the music part, so there's 14 paintings in the show, um, one for each month of the year, plus we had Blue Moon, which is when, um, when a moon happens twice in a month. So August last month had two moons, two full moons in the month. And then new moon, which is when the moon is gone, the absence of the moon. So when the moon is opposite, or it, the moon is in front, in between us and the sun, so you don't see the reflection of the sun on the moon in the sky. So, so that's the painting in the back. That's a very black on black painting. So, um, so yeah, the fourteen moons, and then Nick did fourteen tracks to accompany each painting. And Whose idea was it? It was his idea oh. to, well done, to make <laughs> the music to go with it. He approached me and, and 
But you, you'd ask me to, you were like, you're like some really cool Indian music would be nice. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, it's probably one of those conversations you just have, you know, like his studio and my studio are near each other, so we talk about art and music and all of those things often, and um, so, so it was, I don't know, I guess he's saying it was my idea, I thought it was his idea. <laughs> None of us are going to take credit, I guess. <laughs> well, whoever. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Nick, did you find it challenging? I did. I, I probably completed 12 songs that got thrown away from the project completely. The first 12 songs I, I made for it just weren't hitting the mark at all. So I went through a process of discovery. I never had played any music. And that was him throwing them out, not me. That was good. <laughs> um, oh yeah, they were, they were, they're not even me side. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there was a lot of, a lot of discovery. Um, I love listening to ambient music, but I had never tried to compose it before. And this isn't really, I feel like this isn't really true ambient to me. There's like more going on than a, yeah. a lot of ambient music would. Um, and then did you, were you talking about, like, were you having Anne listen to it and say, what do you think of this? Or, or were you really just like, I trust you, whatever you feel good about, and then let's just listen to it and it works. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and there was a little, like you would bounce ideas off of me. Um, and and I was like I was sharing the paintings with him as they were developing and and sort of and letting him know which one was which to sort of in case that helped him set a mood. Yeah. Um, and then he would play things for me and ask my opinion. But I I in no way was orchestrating anything as far as the music. It was yeah that was completely intuitive on Nick's part. And um, but I mean I think like. Be, like anyone who's collaborating, we're sharing ideas and we're talking about things, and and it developed out of those conversations. Yeah. But in, in our yeah. household, we're playing music constantly. Yeah. So yeah. we have a very good sense of like, so I've been playing like different ambient albums and things, and like, what do you think about like this kind of a mood? And <laughs> so like we would try to like talk about some concepts. Yeah. And I just sort of ran with them. Yeah. Well, it really adds a lot to the yeah. to create this whole environment when you come in here. It's really wonderful. Um, is there anything else important about this particular body of work that I'm missing? I mean, I'm <laughs> sure I am. <laughs> right. And we'll do it the end. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I think there's. A, yeah. There. It, I think experiencing it is yeah. important. Yeah, no, it's really wonderful. And um, do you, in your mind, like, do you do you think you're going to keep working on the moon? Have you explored the moon fully <laughs> for now? Um, or? I'm, I'm, I might step away. Well, there's an eclipse coming, so <laughs> I'm working on an eclipse. Piece. Are you? I am. <laughs> Which won't be done in time for the eclipse, but it will honor the eclipse that's happening yeah. in April. Um, so no, I'm not done with the moon. And then I have some other ideas, but it's gonna. I mean, we're we're moving out beyond the moon. I think. Yeah. Like okay. I'm thinking about a piece called the Cosmic Dawn, which is about when like the first stars ignited in the universe. Mm -hmm. So that might become a piece. Mm -hmm. I don't want to work a little larger. So mm -hmm. I just get myself into all kinds of trouble making promises to all these people. Yeah. <laughs> 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 How's that larger piece going? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, right. We just did it to my Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Do you think uh, that you should explore sculpture again? Or did this I, feel very specific to this? No promises, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never. We've already got it now doing larger work. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I enjoy making the sculpture. I'm not quite sure. I mean, the, it's very easy for me to like think about where the next painting's going to go, because it's yeah. a practice that I'm comfortable with. Yeah. And it's so you know, if I have a short amount of time, I can go to my studio and I can work on 
a painting. I can right. like I can progress in that time. Sculpture it takes a dip. like I had to sit a lot more when I was working on sculpture and just think yeah. about things, which was really rewarding to be able to give myself the time to do that. Um, but painting is is more automatic for me, yeah. so it's easier. So I'm not going to say that I'm not going to do another sculpture. I just don't know. Like I don't have that. Like the next sculpture is yeah. going to be this, but I have the the next painting is going to be this. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, if the time if the time arrives. But I think it would be interesting to do this. And I was talking to Eris Georgia this about like it would be cool to do this in metal and have it outdoors and like. Yes. Yeah. It would be. It would be. And so you said. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be cool. It would be interesting. I'm not saying that I'm gonna make that happen. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> so the form that I feel like I maybe I know this, or maybe I made this up yeah. for me in your studio. The form that you use that you're sketching out the moon forms. Mm -hmm. Um is it the house shape? Yeah, so you can see it in the sculpture yeah. really well. Like it's this plane. So so I know that because the you know the work that you did before this because as I said earlier in the talk a lot of the work was all based on architecture, and and so that form came out of that and there were some other pieces that you had done some really nice sort of black and white studies mm -hmm. with that very yeah. simplified um, house form. Is there a reason the the house becomes a moon or, or am um, I pushing it? I mean, or is it just you know? I think it it was a bit of like. I had been interested in delving into architecture, but I'd also been thinking about how to abstract that architecture in a way. So, so the house form came out of this idea of like, what is the like a, a very basic architectural form that is recognizable? Yeah, and the most very it's, basic, house like you know, a, a square with a triangle on top yeah. is like yeah. house. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I sort of distilled architecture down to house and then used that to sort of build abstraction yeah. in the work. So is there a direct connection between the house form and the moon? In some ways, I mean, I think it sort of arose out of connection, like I'm connected to where I live and the moon is in my view in where I live. So it was like, it was sort of grounding this body in the sky in this way that it could bring me back to a place. So the, I guess the house is sort of me, or and I've also thought because there's three of them, I think of the house as my family. Yeah. Like yeah. it's my my me, my husband, and my daughter. So it's this mix of like us in this yeah. house in this form, and then abstracting that out into a larger context. Yeah. So. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> I was also just thinking that, you know, the moon is, um, no matter where you travel, you know, because we can actually look at the moon, we can't look at the sun. I mean, we can, but it's too bright and it hurts yeah. our eyes. <laughs> but we, you, can look at, you can look at the moon and yeah. you can gaze at it. And so I feel like in that way you can have more of a relationship with it. So if you could travel to the other side of the earth and it's it's there with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the stars do that. The whole night sky does that. But the, the sky changes depending yeah. on where you are right. and, yeah. and which hemisphere you're on. I and I just like, so then that. maybe that also, it feels like, yeah. so the moon becomes home to you because it's your ground. Yeah. It reminds you that you're still here yeah. on the same planet. And I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, it is, I think it is that, like we all have a connection to the moon. Yeah. Because it is, this truly recognizable body, and I and it's the brightest thing in the night sky. So we, I think, I think especially as artists, we sort of can't help ourselves but to yeah. sort of romanticize it and think about it, and 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 it, you know, it, it has a force on yeah. the planet, like it controls the tides and yeah. it influences migration <laughs> and it influences how you know, like. Like sleep patterns and all kinds of things. So, yeah, it's it's a mighty force. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting to think about, you know, your your original work, which was all about these sort of very human made sculptures, yeah. and some of them were almost making commentary about. They were like 
sort of things we think about in architecture that aren't even necessarily the most beautiful things. Right. Like parking ramps, or you, you, for a while you painted like track housing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And actually, yeah. So there was a little bit of this yeah. sarcastic, like, yeah. and now, you know, there's just, it's all about beauty. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and I, I like to think that my track houses were something were about. about see, I mean, it was it was more tongue in cheek for sure. Yes. But it was it was about sort of pulling beauty out of a landscape that might not be right. seen as beautiful. Yeah. Or why are things yeah. something's beautiful and something's aren't? Yeah. 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 Anyway, it's it's a it's a really really beautiful show. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to let people ask questions or chat with you now if they want. Have you exhibited your squall paintings? I showed them here um, it was a couple times, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think yeah. a year ago or so. They were in a, I don't know what show it was. Well, we had a couple just recently in non term, right? Oh, yeah, those are. Those are Similar. Those are like, yeah, those those are sort of my reaching out beyond the moon. Oh, so yeah. I'm still thinking about, they were constellation oh, based. Exactly. So they, they're a similar format as these, but I'm actually breaking the shape up in a, yeah. in a bigger way. But the first original little moons were here for a show. Yeah. I think it was a landscape based show that we had. Yeah. So I showed all 12. All 12. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Or no, they were 13. Yes, yeah. I did blue moon for that. Yeah. So. Am I right in assuming that physically or figuratively that's a horizon that you see at the bottom? And was that always integral to the thought? To me, that's as powerful as any other element. And, and when you were talking about grounding, that's what's jumping out at me. And, yeah. and it puts you in the, in the spatial relation to the geometric objects and the, the color choices around that. And, they're of differing depths, but to me, that's an element that's really jumping out. It's powerful <laughs> to me. But so what is it? How did that evolve? And and were they always going to be different colors, part of the same palette, particular for that month? And and and, and how did how did the horizon come about? Yeah, I mean, the the horizon is definitely there as a grounding element. It without the horizon, it's it's just a shape floating in different. space, but that that line, and, and it's you know it's interesting again. I think this is similar to my distilling <coughs> architecture down to this really simple form. Like if you put a horizontal line across a canvas, it's instantly red as horizon. Like it's just I think it's our natural tendency in the way that we orient ourselves. We see this line and we think horizon. So it's very it's it's a very easy notion to sort of portray, but then to have this shape floating above that, I think it gives it it gives that horizon line an even more grounding feeling. Um, and as far as the color choice, yeah, I mean that was just sort of me playing and thinking about the colors that you see in the season. How about the height of it? Oh, the variation the height. Yeah, yeah that. Mostly, I, it was interesting. I, I, for a while, was thinking about doing the horizon line in a way where it like gradually rose and then descended through through the whole cycle because I was thinking about like the length of a day and like as you get closer to like the equinox, it would be maybe the horizon line would be closer. But ultimately, I just decided to do what felt right the day that I decided to start that conversation. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, Eris. Eris. Um, I didn't know you had a printmaking background. Oh. So it had something to do with this, this question. Sure. And these are, you know, beautiful things. But I'm curious about the format. They're all identically the same size at the same oh. elevation. And I'm interested okay. in that in terms of the con also interested in that in terms of the contrast of making sculpture. Sure. Uh, why is this format, for example? What like the scale? Sure. Oh, this, I mean, part. I mean, part of it is I'm they're pre-made panels, so I'm sort of tied into what is available for me for the panels. But I wanted I wanted it cons like I chose to do them all the same because I wanted this. Consistent of the pieces 
throughout, like to think about it throughout a whole year to, to sort of tie each piece with the other pieces in the room because the cycle of the moon is the same, so it makes sense that each like that each piece would be the same rhythm. I think yes. it had to do with like balance and rhythm and um, but why the scale I Fit well in the space, and I didn't. I didn't say, I, I, I kind of wondered if, because you knew you were creating yeah. them for the space, I right? Know. I mean, I knew that I wanted to do this body of work specifically for this room. So, if they were smaller, it wouldn't fill the room, and if they were larger, they might they would feel too crowded. So, the sculpture was late in this process, right? The sculpture was, yeah. I mean, I knew I wanted to make a sculpture, I did not know what it was going to look like exactly until. The 11th hour. <laughs> yeah. Larry. Uh, I've enjoyed your work for such a long time, and what really appeals, it's so appealing about your work is that your, your paintings are yes and. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they were tracked houses, but yes and, there was so much more. And yeah. yes, they were parking garages, but there was so much more. And these uh, are, again, the same, same category, yes, and yes, it's a celestial body floating yeah. above a horizon line, but it's so much more than that. Uh, and what is, is, draws us in is that there are so many wonderful contradictions uh, mm -hmm. in the painting. So, so yes, it's a celestial body that we can understand as the moon, but it's also an interior painting. It's, it's, it's a painting about an interior mm -hmm. universe. Uh, and that object is floating, but it also has an incredible mass to it. It's got an incredible fragility to it. It's incredibly solid. It's opaque. It's translucent. It's transparent all at the same time. And all those things are going on, and then all of the, you know, uh, all of the associations that those bring to mind about our, our, our own ability to lead, to lead uh, our quest to lead an undivided life, or to reconcile the outside you know, world with our inner life. Yeah. Uh, all of that's going on with, uh, in, in these paintings. You know, it's, 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 they're, they're just stunning. Uh, it's, it's, it's such a, it was interesting you mentioned earlier the idea that maybe our moon is leaving us and it's going away. But there's, there's also another phenomenon that happens in astrophysics, and it's called, it's called the Rorsch limit. So there's a point in all inner uh, uh, gravitational relationships uh, called the Rorsch limit, where if a, a body that's held together by gravity gets too close, to a larger celestial body, its gravitational field disintegrates, and that moon will actually disintegrate. So the rings that are around Saturn are an example of that. So Saturn, there is originally surrounded by hundreds of moons, and as they get too close, they actually disintegrate, and so the debris that we perceive as rings are actually these disintegrated moons. So, so when I see these paintings, I see something that might be going away, but it's also something that's moving closer and the moon is disintegrating. Okay, so that's, you know, <laughs> 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 There's a lot going on. Yeah. And they're, they're just, you know, uh, just so enjoyable. Okay, I just want Larry to write about the show. <laughs> 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 yeah. I just want to add to what Larry just said. All that you're doing keeps us away from looking at them as gems. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. oh okay. and I so appreciate that. Yeah. Because if somebody just saw it for the first time and said, Oh, these are nice precious stones. Yeah. No, they're not. <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's yeah. the finger ground and it's the ambulance that's happening. I really appreciate that. Of course I've seen your work for transition. <laughs> right. That's right. Really fun too. Yeah. So, they're better than gems. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I mean, thinking about them certainly came up while I was working on these, and I feel like some of them do have, they hint towards that a little bit, but I, I was very intentional in trying to, to stay away from too much symmetry, because I think if they were very symmetrical, they would start to feel more like a gem, right. and I wanted that, that kind of roughness that I feel like they have. Mm -hmm. I didn't want them. I didn't want them to feel precious in the way that we think of gemstones. Right. I wanted them to feel significant in a different way. It's interesting. I never thought of them as gemstones. Okay. I mean, I never even thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess yeah, the whole time I knew what we were doing. Yeah. 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 You're too close to it. <laughs> Great, Richard. Um. So. 
something I've been thinking about lately a lot is time. And something a couple different writers have pointed out to me um, independently of each other is two different Greek, classical Greek concepts of time. One is chronos, which is what we must think about as linear time. And then they had a concept of chorios, which is um, propitious time or time that's ripe or, you know, <clears throat> carpe diem, if you want. Um, okay, this has to happen now. And it occurred to me when you were talking that um, that really came into play when you were talking about the, the limitations or constraints of working with the Cassine. You know, it's like, I can't, you know, it's, it's, it's determining the, your time frame of working and limiting you. But then also how that was a correspondence to, um, you know, the moon cycle doesn't match with our calendar. Oh, sure. And how yeah. that's a much older way of orienting ourselves mm -hmm. towards time and it's cyclical and and the um, just the way you know we traditional cultures that are hunter gatherers even are much more tied to that moon or the or the planting season and so that there's a an uh, you can see how that they understood time to be ripe at certain mm. You know, like you go to the farmer's almanac and you're, this is the right time to plant, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, I think that's like, I, and I see this, that in this exploration that you're doing is like maybe, and so I'm wondering, is doing this work, has it changed, do you think it's changed your relationship to the way you perceive time at all? Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Um, I mean, I, the the body of work didn't. It wasn't linear, and I, I mean, I talked a little bit about that using this painting as an example, where I it was an early painting, mm -hmm. but it was also something that sort of happened at the end. So, so that like that aspect of working on them, they were all sort of being painted at the same time. It, like this whole body of work over a year and a half. It, it, it's not like I painted that painting and then I painted this painting and then I painted that painting. And it, even though it sort of tracks a year, it doesn't follow that year in a linear way. Um, and, and I mean, I think about time. I, Natalie and I here at the gallery joke a lot about how time doesn't exist. Like it is. Something that we, like we as humans, have made up this idea of like the constraints of time, and how we, you know, we have, we, I think especially in our society, and maybe this has to do with being a parent too. It's like an endless list of lists, <laughs> and you're constantly ticking things off. And these paintings were, I mean, obviously I had a time frame and I had a deadline. I needed to have them in a show, but I. I gave myself a lot of time to work on them, and and I didn't. I didn't. It didn't have to be something that I ticked off a list necessarily. I could come in and work on a piece, put it away for a while, think about a different piece. So I, I mean, I do think they have a relationship with time. I mean, I think when you come in and you view the work, it feels like the passage of time. Yeah. I mean, it is because it's yeah. the cycles of moon. Sure. sure. Yeah. But. Um, Almost in a way where you feel like, I don't know, like it reminds you that time, time is precious because it seems like it's passing over quickly. Like this yeah. was a whole yeah. year. <laughs> yeah. And, but I, I'm also like think well, because I, we're, I, Rebecca and I are in this class about the moon right now, and the last class that we were at was, was talking about how like human civilization set our calendars to the moon, but then it doesn't. It doesn't line up with with a, with a year. Like it doesn't. The the full moon doesn't always land on the solstice. So at some point, the seasons get off, and that first full moon after the you know after the winter solstice isn't. It's like 
it's not that's not the time that you're supposed to go and do this thing in agriculture or hunting and gathering. So the the, the calendar needs to be reset every you know so often so that it does sync back up to that sort of cyclical nature of the year and how there were practitioners that were in charge of resetting the calendar. In how culture. often does that need to be done? 18.6 years. It's, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was one of the statistics. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That was one of the statistics. Right. Yeah, and so they have you. She's going to pass the class. I'm going to invite you. <laughs> Well, I was thinking you must be aware of the moon. Like, are you like tuned into like it's almost it's like a week from the full moon, or are you aware of that? Does, I, did you pay attention to that as you worked on your work? I did. Yeah. 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 So I I spent um, time. I mean, I paid attention to it, but I also used app, you know phone apps to help keep it on track. <laughs> so I used technology to help me pay attention to it, but I also used my own observances to pay attention to it. Yeah. Um, and then on the, the evening of the full moon, I would journal, I would write, and that's where, it's, that's where the writing oh, in cool. the show comes from, is like my sort of thinking about what was going on in the environment at that time, what was going on in my life at that time, what was going on in the world around me at that time, so, so there's a reflection on the moon at each, each full moon cycle. Yeah, that's really yeah. beautiful. So attracted in that way. So time did play a lot yeah, into yeah. the. Yeah, and I, I'm just reminded of when I came and we, we were setting things up and we had a conversation and we, we talked about how, we're talking about process and yeah. you said something about how the, the having the time to do these and the, the, you know, time in your studio is so different in terms of the day to day. Mm -hmm. rigmarole that we all have to deal yeah. with and yeah. like that that's a, a contemplative time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how yeah, precious that is for yeah. anyone who can right. <laughs> yeah. carve it's, that out. Yeah, it's precious and it's a privilege too. Yeah, to, mm -hmm. yeah that I try not to take for granted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anna, have you, have you considered uh, having this show travel? Yes, please. <laughs> the, the, Do you have ideas? The, yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, the, the continuity uh, of the design is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and I think this, as, you know, this is a, a very strong statement as a whole mm -hmm. and would, would fit into other venues possibly uh, in, in a successful way. Yeah. If they have a nice square room. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. the walls black That's it. Yeah. <laughs> possibly. Yeah. There's a number of spaces that have, have enough space and enough removable walls that they could actually create the, yeah. the correct proportions yeah, you're right. to, yes. to make it work. And I, I thought when I first walked in and saw it alive of it, immediately, oh my god, this show needs to turn out because we need to see it. Um, it's, it's really different to be here in this room with a number of people and the conversation going on as it was for the first time I came in by myself and standing in this space with, with this amazing work. Um, the first time I came in was very wrong. Um, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, had a, I had an immediate, powerful, emotional feeling about it. Mm -hmm. as, as you mentioned, Teresa, it's, it's very, it's very big really chapel. Yeah. Um, and, and a couple of people have talked about the, the detail of the individual pieces that there's and, and they're all beautiful and, and, and um, complex and powerful in themselves, but the, the power of the whole thing together and with the music, it's just, it's just really, really a, a wonderful experience and it needs to travel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, oh, now you've heard it. I'll work on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, now you'll be holding me accountable yeah, for that. Right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm starting to think about connections yeah. I have with people. Yeah. 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 Let us know. Yeah. 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 Here's. Kind of another joke detector question. I <laughs> sure, I love it. <laughs> when I looked at your, you know, before the sport came around and I saw your previous work, I thought maybe it was generated in Rhino or something like that. Oh. <laughs> or Aud AutoCAD or something. Yeah. Have you ever thought about uh, or is that just not interesting in your voice? No, I mean, I, I, I'm interested in computers and, and programming, and but I've never worked with Rhino or AutoCAD, um, but I, yeah, I mean, there's, it's interesting, but it's not, that's not where these are coming from, yeah. I mean, you, well, you know, you could, yeah. uh, like that one behind you, for example, <laughs> yeah. you know, just rotate that thing, yeah. right? Right. Which, uh, yeah. could lead to other ideas. Yeah, well, and that was part of, when I was thinking about this other element, or in early stages, like, I'm like, I'm going to make a sculpture, and then I'm like, oh, maybe it needs to be, like, an animated video, because that could be a really way, an interesting way to, to explore the dimension of something. Um, but I wanted, like, I, yeah. I wanted the physicality of making an object that, so ultimately that, pro this process won out over trying to learn autocad. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I actually, for you. I actually think that the fact that nothing is moving is critical mm -hmm. to the whole experience. Mm -hmm. And as I, and the sculpture, we haven't talked a lot about that, but it's it's really the grounding element here that as I sit. I'm staring at it and I'm seeing the movement and the motion mm -hmm. around almost like plant, the moons around a planet oh. or rings around you know, a moon. Um, and it, it just, my eye just keeps going back to the pieces. And if you only had one, it doesn't move. But oh. if I don't line mm -hmm. up and I'm seeing the movement as I scan mm -hmm. around this central. And then I don't know if the LED was part of your original um, design for the sculpture, but it adds a holiness to the, to the <laughs> I religious wanted, experience. I wanted, like it to feel I wanted it to feel illuminated. I wanted it to feel like the moon. So I, that was, yeah. It's I mean, it was, it, was it, it originally going to be LED? I don't know, yeah. but it, I wanted it, it to It works so illuminated. well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that you say the thing, the object floating in the middle of the space grounds the show. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's that contrast between... Yeah. Because everything, we become relative to everything yeah. else, and as you move... Yeah. 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 Any, any last questions before we wrap this up? I have one quick question. Yeah. It's interesting, because I was thinking about the light, too, that it's round. Uh -huh. You know, and of course people might think, oh, the moon, it's round, or it's got shapes that are like crescents or halves, or, so, so, what do you think of that circle? I mean, <laughs> since you're a geometry it's, person. Right, it's, it's the cool. only true circle in the whole yeah. show. Yeah, yeah. Right. really interesting. And, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and I contemplated whether a circle was the right shape for it, mm -hmm. because it's, because everything else has mm -hmm. angles. Mm -hmm. Um, but it felt right. I mean, it felt like a way to, to sort of honor right. the moon and to maybe be another point where, like, if, if you're looking at this and you're just like, I don't get why, sh like, why is that a moon? I don't get, mm -hmm. like, what, that there's nothing round about it. It brings mm -hmm. that shape in. Mm -hmm. So, so it was intentional, but yeah. But also, I think because, um, because the sculpture, the part that's hanging below the circle, that's the moon. Right. Because right. none of your <laughs> moons are round. Yeah. Right. Right. It sets it apart, so you don't. You're not thinking that the round part. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's mm -hmm. great because the moon. You don't see the moon in that form in the sky, right? Yeah. So she's yeah. already doing it. So your geometry right. twist. Right. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really fascinating. Yeah, that would be disconcerting if you went outside the moon. When the moon stays like. <laughs> <laughs> Just around. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks everybody. And thank you, Anne.
Um, so hang around, chat with Andy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll turn the music off. Yeah, we'll turn the music off.